Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Shuttler. I'm the pastor of Care and Connections here at Kent Covenant Church. And welcome to worship, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching at home. We'd love for you to uh, fill out those connection cards um, and uh, let us know that you're here. And if you have any prayer requests or if you ha are, are new and have, an, have a, an urge to serve in a certain way, there's cards there that you can fill out that will let us know that. So please fill those out, and you can do that online as well. You can see the link there. Just a couple of things that are happening here at the church I want to let you know about. First of all, yesterday we had a crew of people come and help clean the kitchen in the Carlson Center. See those folks there? They came in. Let's have a big hand for them, yes, to get ready for the fall. It's been a while since the kitchen was used, and we're going to be doing that again in a lot lately, or coming up. And uh, so thank you to those people. Also, Gretchen Johnsrud and Angela Peterson are not in that picture, but they've been helping out a lot too. So anyway, thank you for that. Uh, this coming Friday, we have our next uh, playground and popsicles event here at the church from 11 o'clock to 1 p.m. I uh, hope that you'll come join us for that. And this last Friday night, we had our very first uh, Friday night at Kent Cove. We have a number of those events throughout the summer. This last one was in Kanto. Uh, we showed the movie. It was awesome. But coming up, put this on your calendars for July 29th, Friday night, July 29th at 6 p.m. It'll be over in the Youth Center. We're going to have pastors on the hot seat. And so this is a hot wing eating contest, all right, between the pastors on staff. And so, but there's a twist in that Every time they have a wing and it gets hotter and hotter, each time they have to answer a question while they're trying to eat a hot wing. Okay? So it should be very interesting. And we want your questions. So please go to kentcove.org. Right there on the front page it says, it, it says uh, pastors on the hot seat, submit a question. So we need your questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also coming up, we have some missionaries that are going to be stopping by on Sunday, July 24th, and that is Julio and Katie Asasa are going to be here, and uh, there's going to be a luncheon for them after the service. And if you kind of want to catch up to what the Asasas have been doing, just go to kentcov.org, check on Connections, and you'll see the global engagement, and that's where you'll find their latest report. And then today, after the service is over, we're going to ha be having a farewell reception for Janith, Christopher, and Noel in the Youth Center. So as you leave, you might want to, if, even if you're parked over there, head this way and go to the Youth Center and just say goodbye to them. Now I'd like to bring up our church chair, Wanda Colding. Good morning, church. 
It is with great excitement and much anticipation that we want to announce that last week at our covenant, at our <laughs> congregational meeting, we voted overwhelmingly to call Dr. Reverend Dr. Corey Johnsrud as our Kent Covenant's new lead pastor. Please join us as we continue celebrating this good news. On August 7th, during our worship time, we will be doing our formal installation for Corey with our Covenant um, Pacific Northwest Covenant Superintendent. So put that on your calendars for August 7th during our worship service. We have experienced God's presence throughout this entire process and we look forward to what he has in store for us through Pastor Corey's leadership. Welcome. <laughs> Amen and amen. Uh, we're experiencing periods of transition and change. Today we've got, you know, it's, it's a mix of both. We've got an announcement of, you know, Corey and Gretchen coming and being part of our community long term. We're also going to be saying goodbye to some good friends and to some people that have had a significant impact on the youth. Going to be, you know, doing this time of farewell for Janice and Noel. And in the midst of all of this change, the one thing that we know we can count on is our God because he doesn't change. His love for us is steadfast and enduring. Let's stand and sing together and celebrate that truth. Oh, 
Good it morning, is church. Now. Good morning, sorry. Good morning, how are you? I'm all right. Excellent. Before we begin, before we come to the Lord's table, just a couple of housekeeping uh, announcements. want to remind you that uh, if you did not receive the elements as you came in, please raise your hand. The ushers will uh, bring one forward for you. Uh, also remember that if you do the little click down on your elements, that does make them easier to open, which I understand is a relative term. So <laughs> just be sure that you do that. And also we want to remind you that here in, uh, at Kent Cub, we practice what is called an open table. We believe that this is the Lord's table and all those who desire to follow him and trust in him are welcome at his table. So please uh, join us at the feast. It's okay to go. Go. All right, cool. It is now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire his help that they may lead a holy life. All who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them. All who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from now on in his holy ways, are invited to draw near with faith and to receive this holy sacrament. Brothers and sisters, come to this sacred table not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence and pray for the Spirit. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we do not presume to come to this your table trusting in our own righteousness but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the bread and drink the cup that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Let us now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which will be on the screen in front of you. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that, I, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Is not the bread we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Is not the cup that we bless a participation in the blood of Christ? 
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. As we take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. Eat with thanksgiving. Friends, this is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Drink with great joy. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, you graciously feed us who have received these holy mysteries with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom. For you have made us your own people by the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, and by the life-giving power of your Spirit. Amen. Was my cross you bore, so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name. Thank you. 
Have a seat. Well, this morning we are going to have uh, some prayer for our kids who are going to Cascades Camp this week and their families, and also for our youth who are heading out to Unite West and their families. Um, so a couple of things about these experiences. One of the really important places in uh, life and in the life of the church, at least from my perspective, and in the Covenant Church, we have a rich history of covenant camping, of uh, taking time apart and to allow space for God to do work in us. And we have all over the nation amazing covenant camps. And our camp here is uh, Camp of the Cascades, and we have a bunch of kids going um, to experience that, some for the first time. And so we want to just bless their time and pray for them as they go. Um, some of you, if you were at the meetings last week, know that I actually first understood that I could have a relationship with God at Lake Beauty Bible Camp, which is one of our covenant camps in Minnesota. And so camp is one of those places where because we take that time to step outside of our normal routine, we encounter God in special ways. So with that, I would like to invite the kids and parents uh, who are going to, to camp and the kids and parents of those of our students who are heading off to Unite to come on down and just stand on the steps here. Um, we invite you to do that. And then as, and also Marissa and Sherry who are our leaders for um, our Unite group, if they would come down so we can pray for them as well. So I'm going to ask the, you can just gather right here on the steps, that's great. And I'm going to ask the pastors to come and lay hands, and I would invite you guys as we pray to, if you feel comfortable, just um, extend your hand out in blessing towards uh, this group of folks as they gather. All right, students, do we have our students who are going to unite? Is everybody? Okay. Um, Janith and Noel, if you come and um, too and be with the students, that'd be great. All right, and as, as they come, we will uh, go ahead and pray. All right, please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity that these young people have to spend a week learning about you, worshiping you, strengthening friendships, and having fun. Give them open minds that your truth may guide them to Jesus. Give them understanding hearts that with compassion and patience they may serve those around them, seeking to love their neighbors as themselves. Give them sensitive spirits that with wisdom they may discern what is good and important and helpful. May they always walk closely with you. May they feel the support of this loving church family committed to praying for and encouraging them this week and beyond. Thank you for their families who support them in love. Give them joy as they discover you daily in nature, in community, in worship. Fill them with the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit as they move through the coming days. And great and good God, as these children and youth return home at the end of the week, give us all pure hearts that we may see the work you have done in them, humble hearts that we may hear you in them, Hearts of love that we gently nurture the seeds that have been planted in their hearts. Hearts of faith that we trust you are doing a good work in them. Reverent hearts that we may worship you here in our homes and in the world out there. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, I invite the families to go ahead and return to their seats. As they do so, I'm going to invite Noel and Janita to come on up and also just a a note, in the, out in the lobby you will find a table, um, and there we have bookmarks for all of our students who are headed to Unite, prayer bookmarks. So if you'd like to pray for these students specifically, you can go and pick up a, a bookmark to remind you, and there's some specific uh, prayer requests for each one. So uh, we invite you to, to do that as well. All right. So as many of you are aware, uh, 
Janith Christopher and Noel have accepted a call to be a missions pastor at a church in Grand Rapids, and so today we say farewell to them. And we want to just note this uh, with, uh, with a prayer and some words. So, um, brothers and sisters, our church family is constantly changing. People come and go, babies are born, children grow up. People commit themselves to one another, loved ones and friends come among us, Loved ones and friends among us come to the end of their lives. Individuals move into our community and church life. Others leave us, moving away to new places, new experiences, and new opportunities. It is important and right that we recognize these times of passage, of endings and beginnings. Today we share the time of farewell with Janith Christopher and Noel Petula, who are leaving to accept a new call. Janith and Noel, we accept that you now leave us to minister elsewhere. We express our gratitude for your time among us. Your influence on the faith of the Kent Cub youth will not leave us at your departure. This church body vows to tend to the spiritual seeds you have planted and nurture the youth, families, and volunteers you have cared for over the last two years. We release you from duties of ministry at Kent Covenant Church and offer you encouragement for Janice's ministry soon to begin as missions pastor in Grand Rapids. We invite you all to join us in prayer. And again, if you'd like to extend your hand towards Janice and Noel, that would be great. Oh God, for remember times when we together have shared the life of faith, we express our sincere gratitude. We thank you for the moments we have shared with Janice and Noel and in worship, in learning, in service, and in Christian living. We pray they will be aware of your Spirit's guidance as they move to a new place in the name of Jesus the Savior. God, whose everlasting love for all is trustworthy, help each of us to trust the future which rests in your care. The time we were together in your name saw our laughter and tears, our hopes and disappointments. Guide us as we hold these cherished memories, but move in new directions until that time to come when we are completely one with you and with each other. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As a keepsake to remember us, oh, don't go yet. Everybody's in such a hurry today. As a keepsake to remember us, accept this candle and light it in your next place of ministry, remembering that God's light always burns within you. Go now surrounded by our love and led by the promises of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. kids, Mr. Kevin here, and our story this month is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Many times Jesus told a parable because someone was trying to test him or maybe even trick him into saying something that would get him into trouble. But Jesus was too wise to fall for tricks and traps like that. Often he responded by telling a story or even asked another question to get the people thinking and feeling, like like Pastor Trina talked about last week. And that is exactly how we got the parable of the Good Samaritan. The very first verse of this story starts like this. One day, an authority on the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to receive eternal life? What does that mean, an authority of the law? Like a lawyer or a police officer? Well, no, this was probably a Pharisee or some other person who was an expert on religious law, the laws that the Jews of that time had to follow in order to be accepted and approved by the temple, the priests, and all of that. Well, knowing this man already knew the answer because he had been listening to Jesus teach for a while, Jesus answered this man's question with a question. What do the scriptures say? How do you understand them? The man answered, as Jesus expected, with what we call the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul 
and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus tells him he has given the correct answer. But then the man asks, who is my neighbor? Who must I love as myself? Well, here's the trick question. Man, those religious leaders, they did not like that Jesus hung out with and helped sinners. And this included people who disobeyed God's laws, didn't follow God's laws, or followed God in a way that they didn't approve of. But those were exactly the people that Jesus was trying to reach because God loved them too. So Jesus often challenged this thinking, accusing the religious leaders of caring more for their rules than truly loving people and helping them. So Jesus responded to this last question by telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, remember, the Jews saw the Samaritans as sinners. So after Jesus told the story of how a Samaritan was the one who stopped to help the Jewish man, not the religious leaders, Jesus asked, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by robbers? And the authority of the law had to face the truth, that every person is our neighbor, even if we think they are sinners. So how can you love your neighbor as you love yourself? Well, it starts by loving God with your whole self. And when we do that, it changes our hearts and makes us think about people in a new way. So we show kindness to our neighbors, the people who are right there in front of us each day, just like Jesus would. So live and love your neighbor like Jesus asks us to. And I'll see you again soon, neighbor. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Kevin, for such a, a, a great attention-grabbing way to really make us pay attention. God wants us to love each other no matter what. I'm going to invite our kids now to head back to the back where you meet your helpers, and we're going to head out. And as they go, let's sing this blessing over them. Go with God to play your part in his story. Go with power bearers of God's glory. everybody. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm one of the pastors here, and Kevin just preached my sermon, so so long. Just kidding. That was great. I, I am a huge fan of uh, when you notice that the Spirit is working in worship planning and somehow everything works together. It feels like magic. It's not. It's the Spirit. And so as we explore what it means to love each other better, uh, I'm excited that Kevin has already planted this seed. Um, but you may be wondering, didn't we just call a lead pastor, like, last week? <laughs> What's the deal? Why you get this guy? Um, well, just to, to clear the air, um, Corey is a very wise and mature person, also knows that he is a human with limits, and he has had a long week, a long search process, a long... 18 months, a long six years of transition time in his life, and he said, I need a break. And I said, good for you, brother. Um, take a break. So we can appreciate the wisdom and maturity of a leader who knows when to say, I need some time. So you get to listen to me today. Um, but yes, we actually did call him. He will be. <laughs> He's not giving up. Don't worry. Um, so today's text comes from Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we've been walking through Ephesians the past several weeks, and these verses we're about to read are like this, they're like a, pivot, a hinge uh, in the book. Um, the first three chapters are this grand, clear, multi-layered presentation of the gospel message, what it means for us, for the world, and all of creation, and the last three chapters of the book are more practical to-dos about how to live out a Christian life, and these short verses we're about to read at the beginning of chapter four are the hinge upon which these two sections hang. This is Paul saying, because this is true, do this. It's a wonderful, wonderful passage. Let's read it out loud together. It's pretty short. 
Starting with verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Please pray with me. Gracious God, open our eyes to see your face. Open our ears to hear your voice as we are eager to know you more. Amen. How many of, out, of you out there are dog people? Okay. How many of you, that's less than I thought. How many of you are cat people? Okay, we're going to have a rumble in the parking lot afterwards. <laughs> I'm, I'm calling cats, just kidding. Um, I'm, I'm really a both person, um, but I'm much more of an other person's dogs person. <laughs> it's a lot of work to take care of dogs. I love dogs. I don't really feel the need to have foot in my own. But we have two cats, Ella, who is almost 13, and Tim, who just turned 10. We got Ella when we lived in Stockton after we bought our first house. She was a sweet and she was delightfully feline, if you know what I mean. She was aloof yet needy. She sat at our feet, would join our young adult Bible study and just sit and listen. Uh, when we moved to Pittsburgh, east of Oakland, about 20 miles, Pittsburgh, California, um, she turned into this nervous, jumpy, kind of swatty cat. Um, I mean, look at that. Oh, yikes. She would swipe at people for no reason and hiss at our friends. Maybe you know somebody like that. <laughs> Maybe they rode with you to church this morning. Uh, anyway, when we found out Paula was pregnant with our first son, PJ, we were worried that Ella would mess with <laughs> this child. So we thought the smart thing to do was to get another cat. So she'd have someone to play with, and maybe her maternal instincts would kick in, and she'd become a little less evil. Um, it, was a, it was a big, big mistake. We got Tim, uh, and there's PJ too, because he's cute. Um, we got Tim, and she hated him. <laughs> she still does. It's been nine years. She still hates him. She's, she's much less mean to people uh, because she takes it out on her poor little brother, Tim. It's, it's really sad, but the best that we can hope for is that Tim never goes near Ella, and maybe we'll have peace. Uh, the problem is that Tim loves everyone. This is his standard resting position about two inches from my face. Um, and he's not afraid of Ella, unlike my wife, kids, and all my friends who are terrified of this cat. Uh, so silly Tim comes trotting over, trying to snuggle, groom, and all sorts of things to which Ella takes great offense. Cat politics are fascinating. <laughs> uh, but the reality is we as people, we're not that much different, as we can see over and over in Scripture. Ephesus is this hub of commerce in the ancient world, affluent, uh, very, uh, very busy port town, which attracted people from all over the Mediterranean. It was incredibly diverse, and with that diversity came this whole pantheon of Greek and other gods. There were also Jews there, which is where Paul started when he was planting a church in Ephesus. You can read about Paul's time in Ephesus in Acts 19, and it, it is wild. I mean, there are riots, he gets thrown in jail, miracles are happening every day. It has everything a good, uh, good beginning story has. Anyway, a major point of contention for a lot of Paul's churches, Ephesus included, was who belonged, who's in, who's out. Christianity was born out of Judaism, and there were many who thought it should stay a strictly Jewish sect. But Paul was preaching to Gentiles, non-Jews, who were coming to faith every day. So you have these two groups of people from different backgrounds trying to come together in the same house. It's Ella and Tim. Jews were understandably wary of Gentiles, and Gentiles wanted to be a part of what was going on, but were being met with hostility, just like my cats. 
maybe if they don't interact, we will have peace. More than likely, that thought had come up for both sides of the Ephesian church. So as we've read through Ephesians so far, Paul has painted this huge picture of our identity in Christ, what was accomplished through Christ, and what it means for us, and now he's bringing it home. He says, therefore, in light of all this, which is the first three chapters that we've gone through, he says, therefore, in light of all this, live a life worthy of our calling. It's clear he's addressing a problem with this church because he's using really strong language. He says, I urge you. He's using his chains as weight for his argument. The Ephesian church is clearly not doing this well, or he wouldn't be addressing it in such a strong manner. I can imagine this scenario. Joseph, you know, the Jewish farmer, comes to the house church to worship, and sitting in his seat is Antiochus, that Greek IT guy that always looks at him funny because he doesn't eat bacon or work on Saturdays. Joseph thinks that guy has some nerve and plops down a few seats away with a big harumph, making sure it's loud enough for Antiochus to hear. Nothing good can come of this. And we're not so different today, are we? We come from countless backgrounds and experiences. We know what we like. We know how church is supposed to be. We are totally convinced our way is the correct way. Other churches are too showy or too loud or not loud enough or too stale and stuffy, too political, too social, whatever. We know what's good, and we like our stuff the way we like it. But what happens when someone from a different tradition comes? What if they worship Jesus in a different way than what we're used to? What if they smell funny or express themselves through movement or do something we consider weird? What if they vote differently or they emphasize different aspects of the gospel than I do? Because we all do that. How can we be in the same church together? I mean, we here in Kent, we're in a similar situation to Ephesus, aren't we? We're a massively diverse city. And even in this room, we have so many different experiences and ways of expression that come to, together to create this body we call Kent Cuff. How can we possibly maintain unity as Paul commands here? Historically, the church, Big C Church, hasn't been very good at this. We just have to look at all the denominations and ways we have divided over time. When something hard comes up, let's leave those heathen and create a new church with people who think right, like I do, because I'm always right. Now, there's a place for healthy dissent, and sometimes something new has to be born when what is happening is unjust or unbiblical, and it's not responding to a prophetic challenge from other members of the body. But splitting over interpretive issues is not eagerly trying to maintain the bond of peace. It is our fear and pride elevating our ideas and preferences over those of our sisters and brothers, not willing to see that maybe, just maybe, I'm wrong about something. That there can be another way. Or maybe we're both wrong. Or maybe we're both right. Or maybe being right isn't the point. I don't know, but Paul seems to think it's possible for people who would otherwise be in conflict to be united. What's the secret sauce? What are the things Paul tells the Ephesians to help them get together and stay together as a body? Back in chapter 2, uh, we learn that we actually can't do it. <laughs> we can't. But Jesus did. It's done. Jesus has made us one, a new type of humanity. It's not us up to us to create unity. Christ has made us one. Jew or Greek, slave or free, man or woman, liberal or conservative, Seahawks fan or 49ers fan, Marvel, DC, Beatles, Stones, Star Trek, Star Wars, Bacon, or Bacon, because there is no other option. <laughs> it doesn't matter. All who call on Jesus' name 
who put our ultimate allegiance in him and say yes to following Christ are made one by the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit living inside us. One. So why doesn't it feel like it? How can we eagerly work to maintain unity when there is so much division in the church? Paul tells us, it's good news. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. I say that again, in case you missed it. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Paul knows that in order for the Ephesians to be unified as a body, there is no room for arrogance and aggression. It doesn't work. Paul just spent three chapters gushing about the cosmic power and ultimate authority and beauty of Christ. And here, he, here is how he tells the Ephesians they can live that reality. Be completely humble and completely gentle, patient. Then he goes on to list seven things that there are one of. Seven is an important number in the scriptures. It represents completeness, wholeness, and goodness. Seven things. There's one, body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, God. That's an amazing list of things that there are one of. He's driving home this point that we are not believers in different things. We are not followers of multiple ways. There's one faith, one Lord. Christ has already made us one. But if we can't put down our pride as we interact with one another, we are not living up to the call. See, Paul knows really well what pride can do. He was famous for hunting Christians down because he knew. He absolutely knew he was right. He was zealous for the Lord. His pride is what brought him success and fulfillment. He was really good at what he did. But when he became a follower of Jesus, that meant nothing. His pride was a liability. So he worked really hard to keep it in check. He started referring to himself as Paul, which means small, instead of Saul being named after the mighty king of Israel. He knew how to maintain unity with others. It takes humility gentleness, and patience, always remembering that Christ has already done the work of unification. He just had to live into it. In a few chapters, he'll give a great example of how this can work out in relationships. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm not going to spoil that sermon, uh, but the point he's making is the same. Believers need to get good at being humble. Submitting to one another in love. Believers need to get good at being gentle. Speaking the truth in love. Believers need to get good at being patient. Bearing with one another in love. And bearing means essentially putting up with each other. If you have kids, you know exactly what it means to bear with someone in love. When they are driving you absolutely batty, (laughs) and yet you still look at them and have affection and want what's best for them, that's what Paul is talking about. It requires a great deal of strength to be humble. You have to recognize your pride rising up so that you can choose another response. Few people are good at that, but we can work on it. It takes great boldness to be gentle. It is easy to dismiss or squash people with whom you disagree. But Paul reminds the Ephesians that other believers that don't act, think, or sound just like you aren't enemies. There's one spirit, one body, and one Lord. What good is it going to do if we attack our brothers and sisters? 
Paul urges the Ephesians to be completely gentle, not just to those in their little safe circle, but to all believers. We're in this together, Paul is saying. Christ has made us one. How dare you attack each other and judge one another? Be humble. Consider that you don't know everything. (laughs) Maybe there's something you can learn from that person. Be gentle. Aggressive arguments rarely lead towards peace. Bear with one another in love. We're all broken and in need of healing and restoration. And sometimes my dark side shows. And I need your patience as I work through that. And sometimes your dark side shows. And you need my patience as you work through that. Thank God he has already made us one in Christ. Unity is not just something we should work for because God says so, although that is enough, Um, but it's what we need to flourish and what the world needs to see from us. When the church was brand new, just a handful of disciples meeting in homes in first century Palestine, how did it grow? What was it about this specific sect of Judaism that caught the hearts and the imaginations of thousands of people at a time? It was how this incredibly diverse and previously hostile groups could gather together and love each other. Opposing classes, ethnicities, nationalities, genders, social statuses, all gathering together to share a meal at the Lord's table and worship together. While it was God doing the work, it was the unity of the believers that made people notice. It was a community of people determined to be united in the Spirit, each submitting to one another and serving the needs of the community. We need that today, desperately. The witness of the church has been greatly diminished by the centuries of infighting, What the world sees is people who can't agree on anything, so we split up. What would it look like if we practiced bold humility? What would it look like if we acted out of a place of gentleness towards brothers and sisters who disagree with us? What if we worked really hard to increase our short fuses so that we could patiently bear with one another? What if we really loved each other as God loved us? How? What does it look like, someone might ask. I feel like with many things, it's easier said than done, but the answer is simply to do it. (laughs) Love the brother or sister that you don't agree with. Be gentle when you go into a tough conversation, because you're going to have those. Be humble. Look for the truth that resides in their side of the story. If you don't check your pride, then all you will see is a wrong person. Humility allows you to see a beloved brother or sister who is trying to be faithful, working things out just as you are, and may have come to a different conclusion on something. How did they get there? What circumstances in their life and experiences led them to that conclusion? What is the truth that they are seeking, as an, and is it something you might be able to learn from? Even if you don't end up changing your mind, you will have shown love through your brother and sister, and both of you will be better for it. But it takes work. You have to know yourself really well. You have to know what triggers you, know the things that annoy you, know the touchy subjects, and when those come up, you have to be able to respond with humble, gentle, patient love. It's hard. It takes a lot of strength. But the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is living inside of you. You think that God doesn't want you to ask for that strength for the good of the church, his bride? It's not complicated, but it sure ain't easy. 
You have to do what we say we believe. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because, as Paul famously said, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. Love suffers all things. Paul is saying that we must really, really love each other. Like the hard, not superficial, have the hard conversations over coffee, mutually transparent, ugly cry in front of another person, relentless support and encouragement kind of love. The kind of love that is only possible with God's help and not just those who think and act like we do. We are already made one by God, so we must act like it. But what if I don't love that person? C.S. Lewis has a fantastic quote about this. He says, Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love them. You see, sometimes we act because we believe something. Sometimes we need to act so that we will believe something. So something you should know about me is that I have a temperament which is called that of a peacemaker. If you're familiar with the Enneagram, I'm a nine, which values harmony above all else. Not like singing, but harmony. I want people to get along. I want others to be happy more than I want to get my own way. I'm basically a perfect person. Um, <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. You can ask Paula, my wife. Totally joking. But unity is this huge value for me. This conversation gets me all fired up. We need each other, and we can't be what we need if we're unable or unwilling to listen to other opinions and ideas. Trust me. You don't want to be in a situation where you are never challenged. That turns people into monsters. We need to humbly come together to know each other, to love and serve each other because we need it and the world needs it. The world needs to know there's a better way. The world needs to see that there can be healing and unity even in diversity. And when they see it, they will inevitably ask, how is this possible? Then we get to tell them about the kingdom of God and the world becomes a little bit more whole. This story that we're all a part of, the one that started in the beginning, you know this story, and built up to Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and now we are still playing out this story. The story is not just about me and God. It's not not about that, but it would be pretty arrogant of me to think that me and God is all I need to worry about. We are part of a story from beginning to end, mover, moving ever closer towards new heaven and a new earth. When we actively seek to maintain unity, we are living out our calling, and heaven breaks through a little more. When we sit down with a brother or sister in Christ over tacos and have a hard but sincere disagreement about something and can continue to love and serve that person, the kingdom of God is a little nearer, a little more real, a little more tangible. This is the hard, messy, beautiful work of the kingdom of God. We humbly, gently, patiently love those in the body, even those who drive us crazy. And we all have that person. And we are all that person to someone else. I know there are people that I just rub the wrong way. Maybe some of you. What can I say? It's part of dealing with real people and not robots. But that doesn't mean that we can't absolutely love each other and want the best for one another. We are different. But that doesn't have to be a bad thing. 
as we will hear later on in Ephesians, our diversity is one of our greatest strengths. This isn't just a can't cuff thing either. Anyone who is in Christ is our brother or sister and deserves the same level of humility, gentleness, and patience. Can you imagine a Presbyterian and a Baptist actually loving and caring for one another? Wow, what a world. Praise God that in Christ we have been made one. Let us walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's not our job to make unity. Christ has already done that. But it is our job to walk the walk. Talk isn't good enough. To maintain the unity that Christ died for, it takes you doing the work. It takes me doing the work. It's not glamorous, it's not fun all the time, but it can make a big difference to all of us inside these walls and all of those outside of these walls will take notice. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Strengthen us with your spirit to do the hard work of maintaining unity through the bond of peace. Amen. Amen. One faith, one hope, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is in all and through all. We are called. We are called to show, to live into the love that God has given us. I invite you to stand and sing his praise and sing together.
I hope those words get stuck in your head this week. Forgive me for the earworm. Um, Lead me in your love to those around me. Look to your left and to your right. It includes us. It includes everyone you encounter. May you go in peace knowing that Christ has made us one. Now we must walk like it is so. Amen. Amen.